Hey fam, I want to do a video about the panoramic camera that I've been using for my bar sign adventure videos. <laughs> Holy shit! Well, there it is. The Dai 6x17 medium format panoramic film camera. So I've been using this camera for a year now, and I'm quite enjoying it. So what I want to do is just a quick little overview about the camera and share some of my opinions on it. For anyone out there considering making the switch to the panoramic medium format format. Well, anyways, let's begin. So the Dai 617 is Chinese in origin, sold through a website called BH Camera which is not to be confused with the very reputable B&H photo video out of New York City. And since on the surface the B&H camera website seems kind of sketch, I ended up finding the company selling the camera through their eBay store and purchased it through there instead of through the website just to get the ease of international transactions that eBay provides and any of their buyer protections should the order have gone awry. So the eBay listing said the camera would ship in a week, but it ended up being a month because it appears that the cameras are manufactured to order. So if you do buy one, there might be a wait if they still say it's a week out. But it's no big deal if that's what you're expecting, and the customer service is really polite and nice when I sent them an email asking about the shipping status. Although I don't think I ever received the tracking number because I kind of remember just arriving home one day and there it was! New package with camera in it. When the camera arrives, it comes shipped in this aluminum bomb-proof case. You might be thinking, oh neat, I bought the camera and I got a case thrown in. What a deal! Only, this case is uh, pretty useless. It's very, very low quality aluminum and the padding, just some basic eggshell padding around the edges. No separators, nothing to divide or organize anything inside this case. If you look at the website, they show a picture of it, and it's just organized with a bunch of random foam scraps that, in a field use, are probably just going to fall out and blow away. So, in this case, it's okay for storing stuff in on the shelves, but don't expect that you're getting a case to take out in the field with your camera. I'll cover a good case for this camera later, but for now, it's not this one. At first glance, the low-profile appearance of the Dai might confuse you into thinking it's in the same class of camera as the the Fuji the Fuji 6x17s. You know those large oh, no! those these the the larger version of the Fuji 6x9, but it's not. What it actually is is much closer to your standard. Do it! What the fuck does this keep happening? Okay, now that the view camera's here, the Dai 617 is much more a sibling of this camera than it is the Fuji lineup. And what makes it more like a view camera than a, a rangefinder? Three reasons. Number one, the lens. Holy shit! Magic is what I'm doing tonight. Number one, the lens. There are no Dai lenses that come in a proprietary die mount or anything. You just pick whatever existing high quality large format lens exists by manufacturers such as Nikon and Fuji. You might have heard of them. And you attach it to this lens cone that's designed for whatever focal length your lens is and off you go. As long as the lens is designed to cover 17 centimeters wide in the image circle, it can work on this camera. Number two, it has a ground glass. So you load the film into the camera back and has a dark slide, so you can remove the back between every exposure, replace it with the ground glass, and get a precision focus and composition on every single frame. And number three, or maybe metalhead number three, because it's my favorite feature of this camera, shift. Now, I dropped air quotes around shift because actually, if you want to get pedantic, it has up and down movements, which is rise and fall. Shift is left and right. It's a standard feature on pretty much every view camera in existence, and is the feature that mainly sold me on this camera. I'll double back to the film holder and the lens cones later, but first I want to talk about the front rise feature because I think it's the most important. 
If you've only ever used fixed lens cameras in your life, you might not even know that front rise exists or what it's useful for. Once you use it and then discover it, it, at least for me, it makes it really hard to go back to working with a fixed lens camera on a tripod. So pretend you're taking a picture of a building across the road. You set up your camera level, aim it at this building across the road. All the, all the lines are nice and square, except that the top of the building is off the top of the frame. And there's a whole bunch of road that you don't want in the scene. What do you do? With a fixed lens camera, you have to take your camera, angle it up to get the top of the building into the frame. But then what happens is, your nice square building, because of the angle of the film changing, the lines go boop, and now the top of the building is narrower than the bottom of the building. You can either just let this slide and be cool with it, or you can go into Photoshop later and uncorrect it and lose a bit of the frame from all the geometry that has to happen and then you take your nice picture you like and you post it on your favorite form and someone's like if that's a video format why isn't there a frame border on it and you're like well because i had to crop some to adjust the vertical adjustment and the guy's like oh your adel adam ansel cartier brisson never said that you should ever crop a photo so you suck and i hope you die and that doesn't have to happen if your camera has front rise so with front rise, you're looking at your building across the road, and instead of angling the camera up, you just move the lens up. And then what happens is the picture just slides up, and you get the top of the building, less road, and all of your lines are still perpendicular to each other. Ow! As I said, it's one of the most important features of a camera for me if I'm working on a tripod. So while the front rise is pretty straightforward, the cameras also advertise as having the same degree of front fall by using provided tripod adapter. Now this thing, I'll explain how this works. So what you do is you remove the viewfinder from the camera and then you put the adapter, you screw it in right up above, right between the two levels that are on the camera. And you take a tripod plate you attach it to the adapter. So with the adapter in and the tripod mount on your adapter, you then just take your camera, and if you're working at the edge of a cliff, this is even more terrifying, you just flip it over and attach it. And in the zero position, it appears that the framing remains identical so that the adapter keeps the, the film back in the same spot depending where you, when you flip it over. But now you don't actually, you can't actually lower the front because the adapter is connected to the, the, front, the front rail and the lens cone. So you have to rise the rear to do your fall. So that's how you use the, the adapter for front fall if you need it in your photography. I would recommend out of convenience that if you expect to ever need to use the fall that you buy a second tripod quick release plate so you don't have to further undo this and put it up here and dig around just makes it a lot easier just in screw flip done and one more point about the front rise on this camera that view camera that magically appeared and scared me earlier like it has gearing to do the front rise this camera relies on friction so sometimes it can be a little sticky moving up and down a lot of times i find that it's easier just to push it all the way up and then get a finger underneath it right near the lock and then slowly lower it to where I want it and then lock it. Let gravity work with me instead of against me. Moving on. Despite the bad rep a lot of stuff out of China gets for being shoddy materials, plastic and breaks easy, like that new Yashica, this camera is actually quite durable. The body is made from this material that your parents may remember called metal. It's a very durable substance and it features some solid wood grips on it. So it's got a good heft, very durable. A lot of people like to describe durable metal cameras as being like a tank. And I think that cliche kind of falls in the line here too because metal, tanks are made of metal. It's a given. But this is also like a very old tank, like World War I maybe, but 
works better because outside of the lens and shutter that you buy that isn't manu that doesn't come with the camera there's like no springs or gears or anything that's like a watch that more modern cameras have which is cool because it's less stuff to break who hasn't had a medium format camera where the gearing has gotten screwed up and then all your frames overlap i know i haven't It's funny that right after I say it's like a tank and very durable, I hear a screw rattling around inside it, but it appears to just have come off of the advanced knob, the little button that keeps the film in order. So like many low-tech things, I can just insert it with my fingers probably and screw it back in for repair. Got it. Last minute addendum to my durability praises. Check the screw tightness every now and then on things. Looks like there's not any uh, Loctite or anything keeping certain screws in order. But had that been a mechanical watch gear that had broken, I don't think I could have just fixed it in five minutes like I did. So since that just happened, let's uh, dive into the film back, shall we? So the film back detaches by lifting up these two little levers right here, and then it'll rotate out and you pop it up to release it from these rolling tabs down here. Film back. You don't have to detach the film back to change the film. You can just, over here, release, release, and it comes off, which will allow you to pull up these to free the spools and reload. I assume if you have a medium format camera, you know how to load this. If you don't, let me know in the comments and I'll make a great loading and tutorial. So once the film is once you have your film loaded back in, you just snap it on. I like to say this camera is really advanced by 1920s standards. So it still has the window advanced mechanism. So since there's no springs or mechanical auto advance to break and screw up your film spacing, you have to keep an eye in these little holes to the frame number on the back of the film as you advance it and then stop at each one. Two, five, eight, eleven. It's cool because a mechanical failure won't ruin your film and advance wrong, but a human failure can destroy stuff. Like you're like, just shot a photo and you're like, oh my god, I can't believe that I got to witness that sunrise. I'm so excited. And then you're like, oh, where am I? You don't know. You, you could be not far enough. You could be too far. It sounds funny, but I've done this, which is why I'm warning you. Worst case, you just advance to the next number and maybe lose a frame. So that's film advancing. Once your film is in there and loaded and you want to make a photo, you'll once again remove the film roll holder and pull out your trusty ground glass, which will now take its place. So the ground glass is a ground glass. It's glass and you can see the picture on it upside down and backwards like a regular field camera. This camera has a cool feature of this pop out dark cloth lens hood thingy that lets you get a better view of the scene without having to go full dark cloth on the scene. And while it's obviously a dimmer image while using this compared to the dark cloth, I found it perfectly serviceable in, in all the lighting conditions I've shot in. Maybe more at night and dusk when it's less light, the dark cloth might be needed, but so far I've been happy just using the collapsible ground glass shade. So now let's talk about the exciting topic of lens cones. The lens cone is what you need to attach your lens to the camera. So if you're planning just on running with one lens and that's all you ever expect to be happy with, lens cone, perfectly fine. If you see yourself as more adventurous and wanting multiple focal lengths to pick from for each exposure, lens cone starts running into some problems. Number one, at least on this system, they're kind of a pain in the ass to swap. There's four thumb screws around here that you gotta... Alright, I think I got... Nope, there's still one connected. Um, okay, so... To swap the lines, you gotta 
dick around with the thumb screws and then the same thing putting it back on. Not nearly as fun or as fast as the mechanisms that large format cameras use to swap lenses. The second problem is that they're big. This is a shorter one at 90 millimeters. If you have a you know, 125 millimeter lens, 150, 200. These, the space needed to store these adds up real quick. So you, you very quickly go from a one bag operation to a whole second, third, 58, 2000 bags. Who knows how many lenses you want to carry, but it's going to make field work a little chaotic. The third drawback to the lens cones is that they're expensive. Now, on like a a view camera that magically appeared earlier, the little board that you bounce the lens on, maybe gonna run you 20 bucks, less if you can find one used, lightweight, all that. These guys, you're looking at four, five hundred, maybe even more per lens board. So, to expand your kit with this camera, gonna need some money. There we go, reattached. So each lens board comes with a focusing helicoid that comes with a scale for whatever focal length lens you have on here. So I have a 90 millimeter, so this says 90 millimeter. And it has the focus distance, 15 feet, 10 feet, 7 feet, 5 feet, along with the depth of field scale for that particular lens. Now most time you're probably gonna be using the, the ground glass to compose and focus, but this comes in handy if you want to get crazy and start doing some handheld work just by guessing the distance. I haven't done that very much with this, but I want to do more. It's kind of one of the reasons I bought it. But from what I can tell by comparing the focus distance on the ground glass is that these numbers seem pretty accurate. So whenever I find a use to actually shoot this thing handheld, it should provide some fun. Since I mentioned the possibility of shooting this camera handheld, that brings us to the next feature, the optical viewfinder. Now this viewfinder detaches, so if you're just planning on using the ground glass, you don't need to have the extra weight or weird extra profile it needs. But it is kind of useful just to have to walk around and scout out what you're gonna shoot beforehand without hauling the camera to the location. The problem with this viewfinder, there's no diopter in it. So like for my eyes, when I look through this, like it's just blurry. So I don't really get a good clear picture of what I'm looking at, but just a kind of an abstraction of elements. So a diopter in it would be nice, otherwise it's solid, comes with a mask, so if you do bust out money to buy different lens cones, you just get a little mask to replace instead of the entire viewfinder. And I, I find that the accuracy of the framing versus the ground glass is it's a bit more loose. I wouldn't try to tightly compose anything in this. I would give it plenty of area around the edges for a slop just to make sure everything I want is in the frame. So once again, let's talk about storing this camera in the field. As I said before, this case that comes with it is shit. Get it out of there. So first off, yes, I have shot this entire video while wearing race car jammies. Second off, this bag is great for this camera. It's an old Low Pro Nova 5. I think it's a mid-late 90s model, so you can score these on eBay pretty cheap these days. But it's a nice big lunchbox design that you can just drop the camera in. And lo and behold, all the separators stay where they need to for your ground glass spot meter and loop, or whatever else you want to put in there. Much, much better getup than the default bomb-proof case that came with the, the camera. Now this camera works well for the 90 millimeter lens on the 90 millimeter cone. I suspect though that if you decided you want to shoot like a 300 or something, you might not be able to fit this bag because the cone is going to be way too huge. But I think you could probably get away with about a 120 or 150 in this bag as well if the lens you choose is a lower profile lens like this. You can see the, the 90 that I have in there is pretty, pretty ginormous on the front. So 
with a longer lens cone and a shorter front element, you could probably squeeze an extra whatever that is. So this is a good bag for this camera. I highly recommend it. Put something else in storage in the aluminum case that comes with the camera. So finally, if you're watching this video, I'm assuming it's possibly because you're considering buying this camera and are looking for information on it. So I'll provide you some advice on buying this camera. If you already have a well-established large format kit with a good range of lenses, you might be better off just buying a 6x17 back that Dai Yi and Shen Hao make. That way you can still have the panoramic format with your existing kit. It doesn't add much bulk to your bag. You don't break the bank on lens cones and you're good to go. Although something to consider with that route that I've read is that they only work for lenses shorter than 180 millimeters. Something about anything longer and the angle of view inner gets hit by the camera and it doesn't get to the edge of the film or something. If you want to shoot longer than 180, you could also buy a full 6x17 view camera. Then you get all the movements, all your lenses work, it's all good. I think they cost more than this thing does though. But if, you, if you're like me and want to work on a tripod, have the, have the shift available to you, and have the fun bonus of doing some hardcore 6x17 street photography, and you don't have many, many thousands of dollars to spend on a Linhoff, I think this is a solid purchase. Like I said, it's built well if you keep the screws tightened down, and not much that can go wrong with it otherwise. I've been enjoying it. I think if that's the kind of work you're looking for too, you'll enjoy it as well. And that's my little rant about this camera. If you enjoyed it and found it useful, please subscribe. If you hated it and found it annoying, please subscribe anyways. And if you decide to buy this camera and start cranking out some work with it, let me know in the comments.